you know, when I thought about bringing in a religious point of view, uh, I knew I, I knew I would offend some people because that, that's of course a hot topic. And I thought about bringing in a, a reverend and was, is there a reverend out there interested in climate change? And, you know, somebody who would appeal to most everybody. And when I found uh, this uh, particular person, we ran across each other through a lot of speaking engagements together. So I've gotten to know her. Uh, you know, when Heather first watched your presentation, she said, Dad, this is amazing. This is really good. I know you're going to enjoy Reverend uh, Beth Love and uh, her presentation and also our discussion that we're going to have afterwards, because I'm going to ask some, some really tough religious questions along the way. You know, what do we plan? How does your religion fit into this? And, you know, are you looking for the end of time? So I'm not. Heather, would you move along with uh, Beth Love's presentation? Absolutely, here we go. We know what is happening and we know what needs to be done. These words are included in a letter to the future that is inscribed on a plaque commemorating the first Icelandic glacier to be lost to the climate crisis. After it says, we know what is happening and we know what needs to be done, it says, only you know if we did it. We know what is happening. Human activity has so warmed the earth that we are already experiencing devastating losses, losses of life, of health, of homes, communities, and livelihoods. If we stay on this trajectory, we will reach the point of no return, which will lead to more loss, including the very real potential that our earth as we know it will no longer be habitable for humans and many other life forms. We know what needs to be done. We need to drastically reduce or eliminate greenhouse gas emissions from all sources or risk losing the habitability of our Earth home. Scientists first brought this fact to light decades ago and the people of the world by and large understand that this is true. A 2018 survey by the Pew Research Center found that the majority of people all around the world in most countries find that the climate crisis is a serious threat. And although more people are now becoming aware that emissions from food production do make a contribution to overall emissions, few realize the full extent of that contribution. What is not in dispute is that animal agriculture of all of the food production sectors is the largest contributor to food-related emissions. Part of this is because cattle and sheep and other ruminant animals um, emit a very potent greenhouse gas called methane. The book Drawdown says that if cattle were their own nation, then that nation of cattle would be the third highest producer of global greenhouse gases. Third highest nation, the cattle of the world. You can see from this slide that methane, like two other greenhouse gases that are highly associated with animal agriculture, nitrous oxide and black carbon, that they're much more potent in their warming potential than is a, an equivalent quantity of carbon dioxide. For instance, for methane, it's 86 times more warming, nitrous oxide almost 300 times, and black carbon is thousands of times more warming than carbon dioxide. But you can see the good news on the right. If we start reducing animal agriculture and draw these emissions down, stop emitting them, they will be gone within about 100 years, whereas carbon dioxide lasts in the environment for hundreds or thousands of years. Some of it is even left after 10,000 years. So the emissions we're putting out today, the carbon emissions we're putting out today will still be here in 10,000 years. The full magnitude of animal agriculture's contribution has been confused and obscured by industry interests, but public, published studies from reputable sources have shown that the contribution could be as high as 51%, and there is good evidence that exists that indicates that the figure is most, much higher. Regardless of the specific percentage contribution of animal agriculture to overall emissions, the really critical piece for people to understand is that there is no solution to the climate crisis that does not include a massive shift in human dietary patterns, especially in high meat consuming nations such as the United States. 
In fact, numerous recent studies have concluded that even if we are to completely eliminate carbon dioxide emissions from fuels, transportation, and energy, we will not keep temperatures within acceptable levels unless we accompany those reductions by a significant shift in human diets toward more plants and less animal products. And of course, entirely plant-based diets contribute the least to the climate crisis. We know what is happening. And so far, I've only addressed the climate crisis. That's one of nine planetary boundaries, nine key earth system processes, which if we cross those boundaries, it could result in dangerous levels of environmental change. And animal agriculture is, the, is a leading contributor to at least seven of the nine planetary boundaries, okay? At least seven of the nine, animal ag, a major contributor. We're gonna look at the other six. Other than, other than the climate crisis, here's the other six of those seven. Biosphere integrity, that has to do with the effect that we humans have on the functioning of our ecosystems, as well as on the genetic diversity of ecosystems. And animal agriculture is the number one contributor to both biomass loss and biodiversity loss. For instance, through habitat destruction, through pollution, through encroachment on formerly wild lands, through overfishing, through killing predators, predator eradication, we call it, right? Through deforestation and through other means, that is how animal agriculture impacts the biological world. Um, land system change is the next one we'll look at. That includes deforestation. Perhaps the largest way, probably the largest way that humans change the land is through cutting down or burning down rainforests. Forests. And 80% of deforestation is for animal agriculture, 80%. We know what is happening and we know what needs to be done, don't we? We need to stop burning down and clear cutting our forests and we need to replant. We know this, we know this. The truth is leaking out. In 2019, the fires in the Amazon created greater awareness of the fact that the so-called lungs of the planet were being raised to burn. They were being burned to raise cattle for human consumption. And the story as reported did partially obscure the facts because the reports typically said the rainforest was being burned to raise cattle and to grow soybeans, which could have left people to possibly conclude that vegans such as me are the cause of some of the rainforest burning because of our appetite for tofu and other soy products. But of course we know that the vast majority of the soy being grown in South America is being fed to pigs that live in Asia, pigs that are destined to be eaten by humans. The fourth planetary boundary we'll look at, freshwater use. Now you probably have heard about water conservation. People know what the authorities tell us to do, right? They tell us to turn off the water when we're brushing our teeth or take a shorter shower, flush less often, you know, uh, find water conserving ways to grow your garden. And this is what we know, but you know what? We also know that you know, our industrial uses, the, there's water that's, that it, it takes to, to produce the, the goods that we buy and consume. But guess what the truth is? It's really the food. It's really the food. Look at this chart. In um, your household uses for the average person is a tiny percent of your water footprint. The industrial goods production is five or six times what, what it takes to water your garden and brush your teeth and all the rest of that stuff. And the food that we eat is over 70% of any individual's average water footprint, okay? So that's what we should be talking about, not the toilet flushing. Um, but once again, it's not all food. Animal agriculture is the leading driver in our race to exceed planetary boundaries. Here you see in this chart, which is depicted in gallons of water per pound of food, that the cattle, the chickens, the, 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 the pork, the, the, the cheese that are raised for, for food, are taking hundreds, if not over a thousand gallons of water to raise one pound of food. Whereas the fruits, the veggies, the, the grains, the nuts are riding much, much lower on the waves. Biogeochemical flows, that's a fancy word to talk about how the two elements, nitrogen and phosphorus, interact with both the physical world and the biological world and how they flow through those worlds. And what we know is that the vast majority of nitrogen and phosphorus in the environment 
the, um, the phosphorus and nitrogen, nitrogen pollution in the environment is coming from animal feed, growing animal feed. So they have these great giant big monocrop fields that are, that are so over, overused that they're dead and the farmers pump in tons of chemicals to get them to pump out some food for animals, um, oats, wheat, corn, soy, and most of that nitrogen and phosphorus is not taken up by the plants. Very little is taken up by the plants. The rest makes its way into the soil, into our waterways in the form of pollution, flows out to the ocean and creates these vast swaths, ocean dead zones, hundreds of them in the oceans of the world where nothing can grow because all of that fertilizer has just given a huge boost to algae. There are these giant algal, blo algal blooms that take up all the oxygen and nothing else can grow. Ocean acidification, another problem happening in the oceans from CO2 emissions falling on the oceans, causing the water to be too, too acidic. And the ag sector is not the only, but it is a major source of CO2 emissions, for instance, through deforestation, manufacturing use of nitrogen fertilizer, energy use, et cetera. And ocean acidification is taking place at the fastest rate recorded in millions of years. And what happens? The acidic environment interferes with shell and skeletal formation for marine organisms such as coral, oysters, some plankton. And it's, it's not just about losing some pretty corals or some tiny sea creatures suffering, but there are disturbances throughout the food web. For instance, this tiny little sea snail called a pteropod or a sea butterfly is a very important contributor to many food webs. For instance, it's eaten by these giant baleen whales. A atmospheric aerosol loading, that's dust, smoke, haze, other solid and liquid particles that are suspended in the air that we breathe. Animal agriculture contributes through black carbon, again, burning of the rainforest, crop residue, the burning of crop residue, dust that comes up from cultivated land and desertification from overworking the land. We know what is happening. We are not dumb. We know what is happening and it's frightening. Personally, I'm most concerned for our young people. The children of the world are my children. They may not have a planet to call home. There are two more planetary boundaries for which animal ag is a probable contributor, but this is enough for now. We know what is happening. And we know what needs to be done. And quickly, we have already left the safe zone and crossed into high or increasing risk zones on five of those nine planetary boundaries of which four, animal agriculture is the major driver and it's also a major driver in the fifth. We know what needs to be done. Just as 2019 provided a wake-up call to many people about the, re the reasons for re for deforestation, um, 2020 provided opportunity for the truth about human sourcing of animal foods. People, people were awakened, perhaps rudely, to the fact that our human appetite for meat and other animal products has created perfect context for the development of virulent zoonotic diseases. Diseases that have the capacity to completely put a halt to life as we know it, right? Is that what happened? And although COVID-19 apparently originated in a wet market, we know it's not just wet markets. Intensive animal agriculture also provides the ideal incubator for the emergence of ever more lethal viruses. Pandemics have come from hog farms and chicken farms in the past and could again, and next time we could not, we might not be so lucky. It could be much more deadly. The sickness of the industry was further exposed when slaughterhouses became hotbeds of coronavirus outbreaks. Workers in those death factories, who of course are mostly immigrants and people of color, were thrust into the national spotlight in the U.S. and the public got a tiny little peek into the underbelly of the beast. We know what is happening and we know what needs to be done. Why don't we do it? If researchers ask people why they choose the food they choose, invariably the majority say taste. But these other reasons are also very high for people convenience, people think about their health, what do their family and their cultures eat? And the invisible assumption behind both the question, why do you choose what you choose, and the answers is that people make choices based on conscious preference, will, and personal agency, right? Yet the food choices that most people make are destroying human health, 
undermining our core values of compassion and justice and leaving millions starving, millions more overweight and inexorably moving us closer to the brink of extinction, robbing the future from our children. I don't believe that people want to be unhealthy or that they lack compassion. I don't believe that people want to destroy the earth or contribute to world hunger or emerging zoonoses. I know there are people that are indifferent to cruelty, but I don't know a single person who would hurt another living being for their pleasure. So what is going on? If most people are decent and most people are choosing food that undermines human health, devastates the earth, tortures and murders sentient beings, leads to world hunger and pandemics, what is going on? The evidence is clear that this is happening because personal choice has been corrupted by corporate influence. We know this, don't we? Our desires have been warped by marketing, for example. Our taste buds have been corrupted through chemical manipulation of the food supply. The reward centers in our brains have been hijacked. Our family and friend circles have been converted into guardians of the dominant paradigm. Is this right? You try to step out of that and what happens, right? And the formerly plant-centric whole food diets of indigenous in people in most parts of the world have been colonized. Who or what is responsible for this overlay of drivers on top of our so-called personal choice? Follow the money. An unholy trifecta of industry groups, corporations, and elected officials is actually profiting off of all this destruction. We know that this is happening as well, don't we? We know that corporate influences are, are largely driving our food choices. And we know what is happening and we know what needs to be done, but why don't we do it anyway? I'll tell you why. Because as human beings, when we know what is happening, and we know what needs to be done and we aren't doing it, we experience cognitive dissonance. We experience discomfort because our values are not aligned with our practices. Many people deal with the internal discomfort through denial, minimization, numbing, and or addictive behavior. But there is another way, a much more sustainable and healthy way an option where we can resolve our cognitive dissonance by aligning our actions with our values. This is the values, steady. These are our actions coming into alignment. And that is some of the most powerful news here because we can do this thing. It's time to take back our sovereignty over our taste buds and our physiology. We can reclaim our capacity to make real choices untainted by fears of not fitting in or having to sacrifice flavor. And what will be the result of our transformation? With the right conditions, hint, hint, look at the picture, the right conditions, our bodies can heal. I love an, an, an analogy that Dr. Michael Greger makes. He talks about the amazing healing processes that spring forth in our body temples when we are injured. For example, if you whack your shin. And then he goes on to say, well, what would happen if you kept whacking your shin in the same place day after day, or three times a day. One, breakfast, lunch, dinner. It would never heal. That's what he says, it would never heal. When we make a choice, on the other hand, to support the healing processes of our bodies, that process can pretty quickly transform our experience. Within a few weeks of reclaiming our sovereignty and consistently eating whole, healthy plant foods, our taste buds will adjust. Over time, our brain's pleasure centers will no longer be attracted to products of violence and destruction. We will start craving healthy food. We will be able to claim the vibrant health that is our birthright. The further good news is that it's not too late to act to bring human activity back within the boundaries of our earth system. The earth too, can heal herself when we stop whacking her millions of times a day. The same dietary choice that will allow the body to heal will also allow the earth to heal. 
And that will result in a complete transformation of the way humans use the earth and its inhabitants. In fact, shifting diets to or toward plant-based is the most powerful opportunity presented by the climate crisis, our very most existential threat, much larger than COVID-19. And in making this shift, we will not only avoid going past the point of no return on climate, but also realize tremendous additional environmental benefits. As a result of this single dietary shift, we will be able to restore the land lost to animal agriculture, clean up our waterways, see the ocean dead zones come back to life and stop the hemorrhaging on habitat loss, on biodiversity loss, on species loss. We can become conscious stewards, conscientious stewards of our earth and its inhabitants, just as we were ordained to be. We can restore the earth as a garden in which our children and many generations after them can live long, healthy, sustainable, just, and compassionate lives. When we are successful in our goal of shifting human diets to healthy plant-based and plant-strong diets, we will also realize a change in humans. We will see that the human presence on earth is more peaceful, spiritually aligned, just, compassionate, and well-fed. We know what is happening and we know what to do. Let's do this thing. Thank you very much. Enjoyed that very much, Reverend Beth, Reverend Love, Reverend Beth Love. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, I don't get a chance to have uh, much, much contact with the, uh, the spiritual side, the religious side of life anymore. I was raised as a, as a Christian and uh, uh, my wife, Mary was raised in a very, very strict family. And of course I have a, you know, a certain amount of, uh, of understanding of uh, how life is supposed to be and some of the things I was taught. And I, I would like to, uh, you know, this really is a spiritual thing. This is a moral thing, uh, saving the planet Earth, uh, saving it for us. So you would think that everybody involved in any religion would step up to the plate and say, you know, how can I offend the temple? The temple in this case being the planet. The temple in the other cases being our own bodies. You know, it is to me anti-God, anti-religion. What, what, what about that? How do you find people uh, in the religious community? I know you can't speak for everybody, Reverend Beth. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Dr. McDougall, John. Um, I cannot speak for everyone in the religious community. And I, I wanna start right up front by saying there's tremendous diversity, obviously in the religious community. It's actually communities, as we know, many communities worldwide. Um, what I can speak to uh, most authoritatively is my um, my own tradition, which is new thought. And I will speak a little bit about that. Um, but in preparation for this, since I knew you wanted to talk about the religious perspective, I did do a little bit of research. And I wanna say that I, I do not put myself forward as a scholar on world religions by any means. That has not been my course of study. I was, I was born uh, Jewish, but not raised with any Judaism, with any of the religion, with very, very little of the traditions other than that I knew that you got presents on Hanukkah and Passover. <laughs> Um, so um, that was my religious upbringing. And then my mother, a seeker, took us through a few other paths. In fact, I was a Muslim for two years in my teens, and I was actually um, baptized in the uh, Church of Latter-day Saints. Um, I don't think that lasted very long, though. But um, so, so ultimately, I did find myself find my way to a religion that is um, authentic for me, which is New Thought, which came out of Christianity, actually. The early New Thought pioneers were Christians. They were practical Christians that, um, that really took this teaching that Jesus is a great example and that we can do these things too and so much more. They took that to heart and they, um, they looked for the threads of universal truth that ran through all religions. And um, in that they created a, a, a philosophy or a theology that, that came out of these universal spiritual truths. Now, of course, they were uh, of a place and time. And so the religion they created was influenced by the context in which they created it. But um, most people would be familiar with New Thought because it's thoroughly permeated popular culture. So, you know, the song, I believe I can fly, I believe I can touch the sky, you know, the, these ways that we all know that our belief is important, whatever it is that we put our attention on grows in our experience. 
Um, if we are putting our attention, if we wake up in the morning and we say, oh, this is going to be an awful day. Well, guess what? We're going to have an awful day. And if we wake up in the morning and say, oh, this is going to be a glorious day, we're going to have a glorious day. So that's new thought in a very tiny nutshell. But what I found when I, when I did a little bit of research about world religions is that for the most part, the scriptures of the world and the, the, the world, world religious teachers talk about our role as stewards of the earth. This is one of those universal principles that we have a role as stewards of the earth. And there may be differences of opinion about the exact relationship between God and humans. And in fact, I think that's one of the places of greater uh, disagreement is that some people see God as more of a puppeteer in the sky who we've got someone in the thread here who says that God is going to, God knows when the time is and God is gonna transform the earth. And that's one part of the spectrum is like God has got all the power. And then another part of the spectrum, which is more where new thought falls, is that we are complete co-creators with the divine, that God set us here in this paradise and said, dress and keep the garden, which is in the, the, the Hebrew scripture, which the Christians also use. That's the King James version. There's other, other versions, but essentially dress and keep means to, to, to serve and to care for and to be stewards of this garden that we have been given. And and this is in the the the, Ju, Ju, the Jewish scripture. Again, the Christians use it, and there's similar similar injunctions in uh, in most of the religious traditions. So I, I will paste some links in the chat for people who are interested in learning more about specific religions. Um, but this is a common thread. We are here as stewards of the earth, and I take that responsibility very very strongly. I believe that the children of the world are my children. I have for my entire life worked for a better world for the children and suddenly awakened five years ago to the fact that all the good work I was doing in the world with children, with families, with men in, in the state prison system who um, I was helping them heal, heal their childhood wounds, like all that good work would amount to nothing if we lose the habitability of the planet. If we go into either of the two scenarios that Rupert outlined where either it's all gone or we have this Phoenix uh, situation. We must work toward that transformation. As hard as it is, we must work to it. That is our charge. That is why God put us here, in my opinion, and the religions of the world agree. Now, I want to acknowledge that there are um, a number of people in different traditions. Um, the, the largest percentage of such people, I'll, I'll talk about what it is first. Sorry, sometimes I get ahead of myself. Um, there's a number of people in religious traditions that do believe that there's an end times coming and that these signs, the climate crisis, the complete breakdown, the, the crossing the planetary boundaries in terms of, you know, those other earth systems processes, which when they get out of kilter, it could re result in chaos. It will result in chaos if we don't turn it around. It's already resulting in chaos. I mean, you only have to look around to see, you know, that we've got where I live in California, I was one mile from the evacuation zone and all those fires that happened. And I know um, Dr. McDougall and Heather, you lost your homes to one of the fires and people, island nations are underwater, as I said. I mean, we know that this is happening and um, and I look around at this and, I, and to me, it's a call to greater stewardship, but to some people, it's a clear sign that the end times is coming, the apocalypse is coming, that it's soon. And they're looking forward to that apocalypse. And I, I wrote something in the chat about, sometimes I talk to, some, to one of these people, I, I met a couple and they were the sweetest, nicest people. And they too are concerned about the climate, but they have this strong faith that God is gonna come in and is gonna lift up humanity and is gonna save whatever needs to be saved and they have such a deep faith in that and you know in a, in a way I kind of envy that kind of faith because my tradition doesn't give me that kind of faith my tradition gives me responsibility and my tradition says we are in a co-creative process with the divine and it is on us to figure out a way to transform these systems so that we can keep um, enjoying this paradise that we've been given to steward. But I want to just say that of those people that believe the apocalypse, the end times is coming, that, you know, not surprisingly, evangelical white uh, Christians, Christians are more um, likely to believe that um, and less likely to believe in uh, the, the, the climate change is human caused. And then interestingly enough, um, Black fundamentalist sects are or black evangelical sects are also more likely to believe that that God um, that the, these are signs of the apocalypse and that God's in charge um, but they are more likely to um, acknowledge the impact of climate change and that it's human caused and I have a I have a theory about that I believe that people 
I believe that people who have experienced such marginalization, such objectification, such exploitation for so many centuries, um, centuries of trauma caused by the system, that they're already, we know that they're already people who, such people, black indigenous people of color, um, people who are marginalized already, they're already um, at a greater effect from the climate crisis than those of us who are more privileged. And so uh, my theory is that they, they believe it because they see it and they live it. So that was a long answer, but there you go. <laughs> that was a complete answer. Thank you. Uh, you touched on pretty much everything that I wondered about, and I want to thank you very much.